So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Janet Twyman and Melissa Willa, who will be talking to us about how to responsibly increase access to effective instruction for all learners. This presentation is going to offer tips for group-based behavior management and we'll share ABA teaching methods that will support uh, learning in group settings. So a little bit about our presenters. We have Dr. Janet Twyman, um, who is a member of Cayo Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. Twyman is a licensed and certified behavior analyst and is the founder and chief learning scientist at BLAST, a learning sciences company. She holds a faculty appointment as an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Tryman earned her PhD at Columbia University. And throughout her career as a preschool teacher, elementary teacher, school principal, admi administrator, university professor, an instructional designer, and an educational consultant, Dr. Tryman has been a proponent of effective learning technologies that produce individual and system change. She has published and presented widely on instructional design, evidence-based innovations in education, and systems that produce meaningful differences in learners' lives, including speaking at the United Nations and in honor of her distinguished contributions to education. Dr. Twyman has received the 2015 Wing Award for Evidence-Based Education and the 2017 American Psychological Association Division Fred Keller Behavioral Education Award. We also have Melissa, who is our co-founder and chief clinical officer here at CAIO, an agency that provides ABA to children and young adults with autism. Melissa is a board certified behavior analyst and is a former elementary and special education teacher. She obtained her bachelor's degree in elementary and special education from the State College of New York. And she earned a master's degree in behavior disorders from Teachers College, Columbia University. As a teacher, Melissa focused on making every moment count for her students. She sought out and implemented evidence-based strategies aimed at increasing student engagement. Melissa implemented these strategies in her general education second grade classroom and her special day classes for students with moderate to severe disabilities. Melissa has taught at the preschool through secondary level and as San Francisco Unified's first BCBA, Melissa helped the district to create a continuum of programming for students with, with, students with ASD and launched the district's first internally staffed ABA program. Today, Melissa leads Cayo's Clinical Integrity Training Divisions, and she remains passionate about helping school districts to implement cost-effective and evidence-based instructional methods that increase student achievement. And with that, I will be handing this over to our distinguished speakers for today. Hello, everyone. Janet and I are very excited to be speaking with you today on this topic. It's one that we're both super passionate about. Um, as Jagmeet mentioned, the, the purpose of today's talk is to really help us to share with you administrators, teachers, BCBAs, parents who are participating and joining us today, how to take the technologies from ABA, how to take the tactics and the principles and bring them to more students to increase access to effective learning methods. Um, so ABA is often thought of as a teaching method for children with autism that is delivered one-to-one, -one, and that is its most common format, um, but the princi principles and tactics from the science of behavior analysis can really be applied in group settings. And when you apply those principles in, in, in group settings, some of the methods that we'll be sharing with you today you can really reach so many more students with effective teaching strategies that increase student participation and decrease challenging behaviors in the classroom and, and really boost student achievement. So we're really very pleased to be speaking with you about this. Um, the topic comes at a time when we're really faced with a challenge. Educating kids with autism, there are so many more students with autism now, even in the past 20 years, Back in 2004, one in 166 students had a diagnosis of autism. Today, we're in a situation where one in 54 students in, in, in classrooms have a diagnosis of autism. 
And we know that treating children with autism is quite time and resource ex extensive and expensive. So um, the economic cost of caring for Americans with autism had reached 268 billion in 2015. And it's predicted to rise to 461 billion by 2025 in the absence of more effective interventions being more widely implemented. Um, we also know that right now school districts are, are often strapped and, and faced with budget constraints, but now in the midst of a global pandemic more than ever, so many of the resources are being diverted to um, health and safety measures and um, increased air filtration systems and COVID testing. And so budgets are really strapped, we know that. So how can we look at taking effective techniques and, 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 and making them more widely implemented in a cost-effective manner? Um, ABA, the gold standard, that's fine, Jagmeet. I think I kind of got to that point. Um, so we do have this opportunity. There are these tactics that come from the field of ABA that do benefit all learners, not just kids who are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and even for those kids that have an ASD diagnosis, the techniques, effective techniques, don't always need to be provided one to one. So today we're going to really focus on three methods for increasing active student responding, increasing student engagement and learning. But before we get into, dive into those three methods, we're just going to do a little bit, touch a little bit on behavior management tips, because that really is starts as the foundation for um, being able to implement any of these effective methods is making sure that you have general control in the classroom setting. So in order to set the stage for student success, we look at creating a positive classroom environment and, and specifically at making our expectations for classroom behavior very, very clear for students. We want to make sure that we have rules that are posted, that are clear and easy to understand. Um, generally speaking, having just a few rules is better than having 10 or 12. So stick with three, four, five rules um, that students can easily remember. We recommend that teachers state those rules in positive terms, um, something like keep hands and feet to yourself um, instead of, you know, no hitting. We try to state these rules in positive terms versus the negative, what we do want to see so that we can praise those behaviors that we do want to see. Um, we want to provide practice opportunities for each of the rules and call on the students that are engaging in the appropriate behavior and use very, very, very specific terminology to point out exactly what behavior we're, we're happy to see. And, and um, that's for the whole class. And then it's also for individual students when they engage in the expected behavior. When I um, was in a content specialist role with San Francisco Unified, helping to uh, increase this continuum of services for students with autism pre-K through, through secondary, I would get called into classrooms when students were having a really hard time and there was a chance that they were going to be potentially removed from that classroom setting and placed in a more restrictive classroom setting. And so I'd get called in to go and, and help the teacher to figure out, you know, could changes be made, modifications, accommodations to what was happening. And the very first thing I would always look for when I walked into every single classroom was, where are the rules? Where are they stated? How are they stated? And is there a system in place for providing reinforcement to the students? Do the students understand the rules? Um, before we would even look at, does the student need their own individualized reinforcement system? Go ahead, Janet. Oh, wait, Janet, you're muted. I just saw that too, thank you. So one, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Melissa and Kayo and Jagmeet for letting me be a part of this. As Melissa said, we're really excited about this topic. And we kind of also, of course, want to practice what we preach or really think about how do we apply these strategies and tactics and principles that we're sharing with you? How do we even apply it in this, in this presentation? So when Melissa was talking about some of these foundations for behavior management and expectations, how do we set the stage for success? 
Well, those those rules or those expectations could be true for the entire school day. It could be true for a classroom or setting or even just a small activity like this webinar. So in this webinar, what expectations might we have for this session? And so what I would love for you to do is to use the chat, type in the chat one or two three word phrases in terms of what environment do we want to create? Do we want to participate in during this chat? What, what descriptors, what adjectives might we want this webinar, this environment, this learning opportunity to be like? So go ahead and type it in the chat. I know um, Eva uh, is already great at using the chat. She just did a nice welcome. We're looking to see how others are with using the chat. What environment might we want to create in this webinar for ourselves as we're learning together? Collaborative, Emily, Jess, these are going fast, you guys. <laughs> Compassionate, nice, Anna, innovative, safe, right? Whatever we want to say um, can be respected. Absolutely, we want it to be engaging. That is great, Jake. Those are some excellent suggestions. Jake Mead, if we can just show three that um, Melissa and I kind of came up with before the presentation, we kind of agree with you. We want it to be respectful with each other. From our end, of course, we want it to be informative. We want to make this use of your time valuable to you. We want it to be helpful for you. And all those other things that you mentioned, safe, engaging, Hopefully a little innovative, but some of these practices are also gonna be tried and true. So in order to have that respectful, safe, informative, um, helpful environment, we're gonna use the chat again. What are some norms? What are some rules? What are some expectations that might we want to engage in as members of this little community during this webinar? So if you can type in the chat, Use the chat to ask questions. That, Jess, exactly right. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, a tentative listening um, is extremely important. So we want um, to think about what expectations do we want from us as, as presenters and all of us as interacting in this, uh, in this webinar. So Jagmeet, if you wanna go ahead and show some norms that we thought of, you guys had already kind of anticipated this and have already engaged in this. We want you to participate, to actively respond when asked, both as a group or individually. Uh, raise your hand. There is that raise hand function in Zoom. So if you have a question, please raise your hand to be called upon. And then absolutely continue to use chat for comments and questions. So with those expectations in place, let's delve into those strategies that we're gonna share to increase student engagement and learning. And I just wanna reiterate, that foundation, those behavioral expectations, those norms really need to be set up for all of these in order for them to be successful. So knowing that we wanna increase learning and engagement, let's step back and how much time do we have for teaching? If folks wanna type in the chat, do you know how many on average in the US, how many school days are available for instruction? How many school days do we have in a typical, typical non-COVID school year? Um, we've got some folks in there typing it already, 180, 185, that is true. That's about the range that we have. Anybody know how many hours that translates to? 180 on average school days in a year, 180 days of available time. That translates to about 1,080 hours of instruction that we have during a typical school year. So that's our available time, but we know as Jagmeet's gonna show us, not all of that available time is spent in instruction. We have to actually schedule or allocate instructional time because other time is allocated to lunch, to transitions, to recess, to other activities that need to happen, wellness checks nowadays, all sorts of things. So already we're less than 180 days or less than a thousand hours. And then that gets reduced because the actual instructional time, the time that's actually put into a lesson plan that I'm going to do from nine to 9.50, this lesson on math, right, that's determined. Well, that's actually always gonna be less than the allocated instructional time because of readiness activities or, or like we said, transitions. So that gets whittled away. 
less than instructional time is for a learner, you may have a 50 minute laugh, math lesson, but how much of that 50 minutes are you actually engaged in a learning activity, actually engaged in something that's gonna help you acquire, learn, demonstrate, apply the material? So engage time, how do we, what, what's the function of engage time? Where can we go from there? How can we make sure all students are engaged? Well, it's their opportunity to respond, right? We want to make sure that students have many, many opportunities to respond. And Melissa had thought of some great examples. And you guys can kind of think, and if you want to go ahead and freeform type in the chat, but if you think about engage time and something like a calendar activity or something like a math lesson where a student is going to a board or something like a social studies, a middle school or high school social studies lesson where students are asked to read out loud, you know, round robin, alternative, alternate reading um, from a book, kind of think in your head or feel free to type in the chat, kind of free form. How, you know, how many opportunities to respond out of a class of 25 or 30 might one student get? Right? Well, if there's one student called to the Blackboard to work out a math problem, that's one out of 30 that's getting to respond. Or maybe in that given period, three, the Blackboard is big enough or the whiteboard is big enough to have three students. Again, it's not giving everyone an opportunity to respond. So the thing that we want to share with you today is the top of the pyramid. How do we increase active student responding where more students Ideally, all students' time is spent actively engaged with instruction, actively responding. So if we go to the next slide, how do we engage more students? Well, we need to implement teaching techniques that increase active student responding. We can't just wish and hope. We can't just expect students to do it on their own. We have to be proactive, we have to be deliberate about implementing some teaching techniques that increase active responding. And there's a mirror, a flip side to that coin, because basically those teaching tactics elicit more observable responses. So yes, thinking may be occurring, but we don't always know what's there. So we want to make sure that we're using tactics where we can see what students are thinking and what they're doing and how they're responding. So we're gonna show you three strategies on the next slide that, that there are three of many, but we're gonna focus on these three techniques that target increasing that critically important active student responding, the top of that pyramid, because we need to do more in that little bit of less time. So those three techniques, core responding, I'm gonna share that with you. Melissa's gonna give you some amazing, great stuff on response cards. And then I'm gonna go back and share some thoughts with you about guided notes. So these are techniques that you can use with all students, truly. They can be adapted and modified for all students, all subject matters, and many types of delivery modes and, and locations. So let's jump into core responding. Core responding, just like it sounds, is when students respond orally in unison to a question, each question, most often presented by the teacher, but it doesn't always, but most often a question presented by the teacher where students respond orally and in unison. Um, we, I think we're gonna go ahead and quickly show next, just to give you an idea of how it looks, but then I'm gonna deconstruct it for you guys. So Jagmeet, thank you for sharing the video. You guys, this is just gonna be a minute long. And I think we need audio. Yeah, Jamie, maybe because you're muted. Um, if you okay. want to... Sorry about that. Here you go. No problem. Thanks. Question, are you going to raise your hands? Yes or no, everyone? No. Can I, I'm, I'm going to actually today. pause raise for a second. So okay. Let me just set this video up for you guys. I think that would only be fair. So this is Anita Archer, famous educator. I'm sure most folks um, on the webinar are familiar with her amazing work about explicit teaching strategies and increasing engagement. She is um, dropping in on a second grade classroom. And the clip, the little piece that we're going to show you is her trying to use choral responding to teach, um, to have kids talk about days of the week. 
But we chose this clip because these kids are not familiar with choral responding and they're not even really familiar with this teacher. So we're gonna look very quickly about how she sets it up and then how she actually engages in choral responding. So Jagmeet, we're back to you. Everybody raise your hand, then you can do that. But here's what we're gonna do instead. When the answers are very short, we're gonna say the answers together. I'll ask a question, I will put up my hands, this says, think, do not blurt. And when I lower my hands right there, you'll say the answer. Got it? Okay, Ooh, good job sitting up. So get ready. So everybody, what day of the week is it? Everyone, it's? November. Friday. The day of the week is Friday. Oh, I can't believe you'd forget that. Let's try it again. So what day of the week is it? Think. Friday. Well, uh, think. Everyone, Friday. Now let's practice that again. This is think. You don't say it until I lower my hands right there. Okay. So what day of the week is it, everybody? It's Friday. All right. Of course, tomorrow it will be Saturday. I didn't fool you. After Saturday. Saturday. Perfect. That gives everybody a chance to think you are so good. Thank now, you, sometimes you're going to. So um, thank you everyone for just sharing with us, sharing and watching this video with us. Um, there are other active student responding, core responding videos that may be out there that show a lot more engagement, different subject matters, different things. We wanted to share this video with you because it kind of shows there are many things that go on with core responding. You wanna use answers that are short and the same. As Dr. Archer pointed out, like we're gonna just do some quick responding together. She did a really nice time, job of providing that model for thinking time. She did hands up. We all have our own styles. I often snap for a core response. So mine is a one hand up for the thinking time. Some teachers do think and then assign. Um, and then that sign, Dr. Archer also did really well, is that other criteria for corresponding. You want to provide a signal. So a signal for everyone to respond and to respond together. So those are those critical criteria, those critical pieces, short answers. Why? Because if it's a long, drawn out, 10 sentence answer, kids are going to be at different rates. And it's going to be really hard as an educator to be able to listen in, kind of see who's got it, make sure everybody's on the same page. So it helps both students and the teacher know what's going on. Thinking time is critical because we need that time to repair our response. And this is true when we're teaching new skills acquisition, as well as when we're maintaining or providing practice using core responding. And that signal Got to get everybody together. Don't get everybody together. Practice, practice, practice. If you're not right, if you don't get them together the first time, you try again. So those are some criteria. And then the tips to make sure it's really successful is a lively pace. Love, kids love, kids of all ages, even college students, even professionals in professional development, enjoy choral responding with a, when a, with a lively pace, when there's a nice flow to what's going on when there's praise to the whole group for correct, nice confirmation for when we've got it right. Teachers can use this as a way to do a little bit of formative assessment. You can alternate between the whole group and calling on a student. You can do a whole group and hear one student that was incorrect, praise the whole group so that everybody knows what the right answer is. Then do another trial calling on the individual, allowing them to be successful because they just heard the answer. So now allowing them to be successful in front of the whole group. You can alternate between half the group, all the kids wearing blue, all the kids wearing red, everyone whose birthday is in January, whatever it may be is a way to mix up your groups. And then you can, as we said, for the examples, you can use it across any subject domain, any level of student. Um, so our examples on the next little bullet, um, math, reading, social studies. So if we go to the next slide, um, just to quickly show you, uh, so here's an example of Coral responding to teach new information. The teacher could have displayed on her whiteboard screen or her um, smart board screen, this skeleton, and could actually have it up and say, and point to the very first word, the skull, and say, we're gonna learn parts of the body. This is the skull, what is this? Tap skull. Great. 
Um, the bone in the head is the skull. What is the bone in the head? Snap, skull. And so you can use visuals and um, auditory, and we can use this to teach new skills. State the question, pause for think time, tap it if it's visual, like what is this? And then of course we can fade out those labels. So again, corresponding, we can use it to teach new information. Again, whole group and interspersing um, individual opportunities. Another example comes from language arts. We often have word lists. So again, we kind of want to show you the flexibility of core responding. You can use multiple responses. So here you could have a word list and this could be on the board or this can be on a page in front of the students and you can use it, do it the traditional way. You can again, use it to teach. This word is big, tap what word, big. What's this word? You know, next word, what's this word, tap, cheap. And so you can use it the traditional way or you can vertically or horizontally, you can use it for opposites. Here's a word big, what's the opposite of big? Tap, small. Um, all sorts of different ways that you can use core responding and thinking to kind of um, broaden the response levels and the response difficulty, but still using that group active student responding uh, um, technique to do that. So those are some very, very quick examples on the next slide, we're just going to remind you, um, this is, if, if you implemented in group instruction, if you started implementing just one of the procedures that we show you today, one of the um, three tremendously impactful procedures, corresponding might be the one with the lowest effort and the highest impact, lowest teacher effort, lowest student effort, but the greatest gains in student learning. Again, across all sorts of curriculum, all sorts of learners, multiple settings, and various formats. So just a great one to go ahead and try, okay? And then just to show you, just to remind you that everything that we're showing you is evidence-based. And even with learners on the autism spectrum disorder, um, within autism spectrum disorders, research shows that core responding can be an effective way to teach new skills, to maintain new skills, and to provide maintenance for new skills that have been taught. So strongly encourage you guys to try call responding. And next, um, please type any questions in the chat. We can scan those as we go along. And next, um, Melissa is gonna share with you our second great strategy. So I'm going to be talking about a strategy called using response cards. Response cards are literally cards, signs, or other items that students will hold up in the class at the same time to display their responses to questions that are presented by the teacher. And I loved using response cards in my classroom, particularly when I taught students who were more moderately to severely impacted with autism in um, special day class settings in, in San Francisco. And I'll provide you with some examples from, from the classroom. Here are a couple of examples of response cards. These are generic and they can be used to answer a variety of questions, multiple choice where students have an A, B, C, D and a teacher asks a question, gives them multiple choice and the students hold up the card at the same time to answer what, show what they believe is the correct answer of those choices. Um, maybe students have a true and a false card and this teacher asks a question like, you know, the Declaration of Independence was signed in the year 1776, true or false, and the students hold up a, a T or an F, um, and they could have a Y or an N, yes or a no. Um, and, and so this is a way, similar to Corey responding, to get all of the students answering a question at the same time. So rather than the traditional raise your hand if you know the answer and only one student gets to respond, the problem with that is at that moment, the teacher only really learns if that one particular student understands or not uh, has learned the concept and doesn't know what that means for the rest of, of the class. Um, here are two categories of response cards, two types. That said, there's potentially a third type as well, 
being digital. Here are two examples. One is a whiteboard. You could also do this on a laminated card where students write an answer to a question that the teacher is given and then they erase it in between. Um, that's commonly, very commonly used these days, even in, in general education classrooms and was very much used during virtual instruction for students. Um, for, for math problems. So the you know, teacher may ask, provide a math problem, students you know, use the whiteboard to, to figure out the problem and then they hold up their whiteboard. Um, next to that, you see some pre-made response cards. So you'll see the, the, the true or false, you see two flags, you see a British flag, an American flag. Um, you see some other examples, happy face, sad face. We can use the chat for a moment and, and, and let's just get creative and think, what's a question that a teacher might ask the class where students could hold up either the American flag or the British flag? Does anyone have any? ideas for how a teacher could use those. Well, certainly you could use it in history, right? If you could, if you were asking about, you know, conflict and, and whatnot and the revolution and asking questions about different sides, ah, which side of the road do they drive on? Right? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, even in, in language arts, spellings in which, you know, country do you spell um, the word, you know, color, C-O-L-O-U-R versus O-R, um, in, in which country is, is that uh, spelling? Um, so you could see how you can get very creative in, in, in using um, response cards. One of the things that Janet mentioned at the end of, of the corresponding is that one really is low effort. And I have to say, response cards are higher effort, especially when you're using these prefabricated response cards. Um, whiteboard's easy, right? That really doesn't take much effort. When you create some of these and some of the examples I'm going to show, they, they do take um, some time, some extra time to, to create. All right, this is an example from my classroom. And I, I love sharing this because it um, hopefully gives you some ideas that will translate beyond this calendar time and just get you thinking about different times of the day when you have your students together as a group and how you might move from opportunities where just one student is called on a time to where everyone has a chance to respond. One of the things that I noticed when I would go into classrooms, particularly for kids on the spectrum, and I would watch their morning meetings and watch their calendar times, is that, and this would happen in general in classrooms too, one child would be called to the front of the room to fill out the day of the week and you know the year, the month, the weather, while there were a lot of other students just passively sitting, watching, not clear if those students would be able to you know have the correct responses or not so in my special day class i created a calendar folder for each student and inside the folder there was um and jack me if you advance for just a second and then we'll go back inside the folder there were all of the days all of the months the date weather and then um this actually is showing you two examples if you wanted to make it errorless if that's just, that's a lot of stimuli on the left so if that is too much for a student and you were at the stage where you were prompting them completely to have a correct response you could just put one icon for each space then you could gradually get to the point where maybe they're discriminating between monday and tuesday maybe they're discriminating between a couple of weather icons and then gradually build them up to the whole calendar on the left um, and then if you go back one slide to Jagmeet, if you're able, this is what they would then hold up. So they would fill this out. And then when they were finished, they would hold up uh, their calendars. When the, when the class was finished, would cue the, the students to hold up their calendars. And we would say the day, um, we would you know read, read that aloud. A lot of my students were non-vocal verbal. So they were not able to vocalize, um, but they were able to manipulate these cards and use that as their way of showing um, understanding the, 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 the date. Um, and so I give that example because, and, and then this was part of our, our calendar morning meeting time as well. Um, I like 
for folks to then think about like how this can be used at other times when you've got group instruction, maybe cooking time. You have in a special day class, bring the kids together for group instruction of cooking. How can you increase those opportunities where it's not just one child who's pouring the flour? How can you get them all engaged? This was very low cost, very, very budget. Took a cardboard box and cut it into strips, put a few Velcro dots on there, um, did take a little bit of time to to print out the cards and, and laminate and Velcro them. But after calendar, my students, we would engage in some receptive language um, instruction and I would ask them, I would you know, ask them to identify a sight word. So I'd ask everyone to hold up the word store or van and then they would look at their field and they would hold up um, you know, that, that card. Um, <clears throat> similar we did this with street signs. Uh, with the money that you see, you could do that with real coins. You don't need to laminate. You can just put a piece of Velcro on the back of a quarter and on the back of a dime. Um, we would find some of these things also get lost. Um, so depending on how much money you're willing to, to lose in, in that, um, but these things do tend to disappear. Um, the icons we would also have uh, kept in, in little baggies. And so at the time, you know, we would rotate, we had many, many more than, than these. Um, and, you know, I would ask the, the pairs, okay, today we're going to be working on money or today we're working on colors or we're working on, and so they would grab those bags and then, you know, the students would have um, that array in front of them and would hold up the, the response card at that time that they were queued. This is um, another example of prefabricated response cards grouped into first, next, last. Maybe the teacher read a story to the class and for checking for understanding, asks the students to, to answer what happened first in the story and they have to choose one of the icons that represents something that, that happened early on in the story, what happened after that, and after that. Um, these are a couple examples that are actually, um, they're described in one of the research articles that we'll be sharing with you. Um, and again, similar to what I showed you with the cardboard, there's an array and the students are able to hold up, hold up the card. So a few tips if you do, and I encourage you to try out using response cards in the classroom. Encourage, you can encourage students to keep their cards facing the teacher just for ease of you seeing them, but don't worry too much if the students do, you know, look at one another. You'll be able to see who's who's looking, who, who needs the prompt. That means they're not quite independent yet. Um, and they learn from each other, right? Whether you're prompting or they're seeing their peer, that's okay. That's where they're at at that, at that point. Um, then use the response cards to modify instruction. What they hold up is telling you they understand or they do not understand uh, at, that, at that moment and provide immediate group feedback. Let them know that they're correct. Um, and highlight what are those correct responses that you're looking for. This is a research study that we're sharing with you. If you're interested, I encourage you to read it. Um, Alexis Bondi and Matt Tinkani, uh, effective response cards on students with ASD, um, and really showed how effective response cards um, were in increasing student participation and correct responding. And then our third strategy, you guys, guided notes. So we've kind of gone up the continuum of, of teacher preparation, teacher effort. Guided notes, you're going to see in the next example, and, and um, Jagmeet, we can go ahead and, and go on to the next example They can see it, is basically providing students some structure to help them listen, attend, and capture relevant information during a teaching session, quote unquote, a lecture, it could be a video that they're watching. So it's providing this structure with critical information left out. Most of the time, all students kind of get the same set of guided notes and they're listening to that same video or that lecture or seeing that, that sample. And then they fill out the goal, uh, guided notes as they move along and teachers can prompt and pause and encourage students to fill out their guided notes. So on the next couple of pages, just showing you some examples. So um, again, any curriculum content, all of these strategies, any content area, any age. Again, the nice thing about guided notes is it helps teach study skills. 
and they're available to the students for later study so that they actually um, can, can do, can learn things as they move on. A couple more guided notes examples. So again, they can increase in complexity, but they can also be extremely simple. So some tips, um, you wanna provide background information so that on those guided notes or in your lecture, so that the actual guided notes, what students are capturing, what they write, focuses on those important facts or concepts, what you want them to learn. You wanna be consistent in your visual cues. You wanna make sure that the guided notes contain the facts that you wanna teach. And again, research shows that across a variety of learners, these techniques help improve study skills. So again, those tips, which Jagmeet is about to show you, um, some outcomes and tips. Teachers have to actually prepare carefully, but it improves student study skills. But when we do it, we don't wanna require students to write too much, especially our students that might need additional support or to, for whom this might be new. Um, we always wanna make sure that once guided notes are completed, we wanna review them. And again, that can be in as we're uh, creating, as we're filling in the guided notes, they can be reviewed and again at the end. And then use some follow activi up activities and some contingencies to support the use of guided notes and to study from them. So why use active student responding? Why did we share these three amazing techniques? Well, we know more opportunities, opportunities to respond for students equals more learning. And that's what Melissa set the stage for. We need more learning in less time, given all the other constraints. It provides teachers, ASR provides teachers with formative assessment. It can provide students with immediate feedback. It allows for observational and peer learning, some skills very important for kids on the spectrum. And really, hopefully we convey that it's really quite fun and easy. Folks, we just wanted to remind you that we do offer free behavioral consultations with BCBAs. Um, if any uh, participants, attendees would like to schedule a, a consultation or enrollment appointment, here's the info for you to do so. Um, Jagmeet's just showing you on our website how you can get started. We'll also share with you in the next minute or two, we've got a couple of slides with just some extra resources for you all. We will be able to email you a PDF of today's talk for your reference. In addition, we're going to send along a couple of other attachments of some great articles and references. Janet, you want to talk about, at all about these digital tools quickly? Sure, just within a minute, just because we know we're living in a digi digital environment, you'll receive uh, links to some of these tools and places to find tools, but there are some great tools out there to support classroom behavior management. We also have tools on the next slide to support um, uh, response cards and active student responding. That EdShelf URL uh, for the Center on Innovations and Learning, I maintain a curated site of all sorts of active student responding digital tools. Um, Plickers, folks might have heard of, it's a digital response card. Guided notes on the next page. Um, guided notes are also high-tech uh, options. This, uh, this screenshot on the left is a guided notes maker put out. So actually you can have text and you can highlight what you want to have disappear. And then it actually prints out a sheet making guided notes for you. And then go formative, now known as formative. It's just an awesome um, active student response, live digital tool to uh, see how students are responding in real time. So just some great high tech options. Thanks, Janet. We mm -hmm. did want to give an a, a opportunity for folks, if you have any questions for us, we're about out of time, but we would be happy if there are any questions that you'd like to put into the chat. Um, happy to answer. And if you think of any afterwards, you're also welcome to send a note to Kaya, us at Kayo and, and happy to get back to you. I do have one question. I know we're right at time. Um, Let's see, what do you recommend as to how to get the teachers at a school site to use some of these strategies? I'm a BCBA who does consults for school districts. Great question, Stephanie. This is a great question. Um, you know, I think just starting small, going in and, you know, as the BCBA, um, well, if you can, if you can observe it, the classroom, you know, first look start with those those rules and see are those in 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 place and then look at these 
these tactics and start with one that you think might make the biggest impact and, and might be um, the lowest lowest effort for the teacher, like choral responding or guidance, depending on what what ages and, and what their subjects are teaching. Janet, what do you think? Um, completely agree. And I would recommend if it's a setting that you're allowed to do this, I would go in and model it. So choose a little activity. Say, hey, you're really excited about wanting to do something. Go in and model a core response um, activity or some response cards or something. And then use those resources that we've provided when the teacher's interest is peaked. Like, oh, this is great to do. Here's some resources. I can help coach you. Yeah. And then follow up. How, how can I, if you're in a role where you do offer support, how can I best support you in, in, right. in your next steps? What do they need? You know, maybe they want to use response cards, but they are so overwhelmed with everything else they need to do that they just don't even have the time, the bandwidth to create their first set. Um, so, you know, enabling them to, to do that. We will also have the recording available. Jagmeet, I'm not sure where we make that available, but I know we will have it available. So if folks want to, um, if there are teachers that you work with and you would like them, you think they would you know, to, to, to watch this and you think they would benefit from it, we encourage you to, to share the link to the recording with them as well. I know we will get that info to attendees. Absolutely. Well, if there's no other questions, we're a little bit over time, but thank you all uh, for participating. Thank you so much to our speakers today. This was just some really, really incredible information, and uh, we hope to stay in touch with everyone that's logged on today.